right, everybody, it's your boy BQ. What it doing? What it look like? Impact Lounge, number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. Thanks for checking in. As always, we're going to talk Impact like we do each and every week. Quick uh, plug of the Patreon. If you want to check out this podcast ad free, uh, you can head over to patreon.com backslash BQ Speaks. And right now, if you just join the $1 support tier, um, you'll get access. That's the promo. <coughs> Excuse me. Wow. That's a promo I'm currently running. Um, I apologize. I'm going to get a good cough out here, and then uh, we should be good to go. <coughs> Ooh, yeah, that wasn't very professional. But um, uh, as I mentioned last week, I'm getting over uh, being sick a little bit. But anyway, uh, dollar supports here will get you any of the content um, that we got going on right now, right, uh, right there. And tomorrow, I'll be doing a review of a. Uh, impact on pop episode re-review you know the episodes that i used to review once upon a time back in the day and then i'll be pausing billing for june and july probably august as well um how does that affect you guys here on youtube it's very very possible uh and i really apologize in advance that for those three months you may not be getting reviews at all um june is a possibility but uh, you know, I, I hate to tell this story every single week, but since I am moving um, from Illinois to Nevada, packing a house, traveling, finding a house, moving, it's just to have to uh, be pressured to podcast would, would make my life very stressful. Um, but when I do get there, I'm going to have a, a setup, better setup where I don't have the glare behind me and all that. And um, probably some new graphics, you know, new logo, new intros. You know what I mean? We're going to we're going to kick it off. Uh, kick it off big, just like I tell Impact, soft rebrand, top of the year, or after big pay per views, like I can do the same. You know what I mean? So, uh, when I do get back on the air, uh, there'll be some changes, and you know, so look forward to that. Um, but I am sorry that if we go, if you go that long without reviews from me, and I understand that's going to hurt my channel as well, not putting putting the uh, content up there. So I may do some YouTube shorts or something like that to keep uh to keep something flowing. So that's all out of the way. Let's talk this episode of Impact. I thought this was one of the better episodes of 2023, if not the best episode. I like to preface, preface, excuse me, um, when I say things like that, uh, to remind you that when I say something's good, I want it to really mean something because there's a lot that they do that I don't like, and people think I'm negative for the sake of. But I hope you really put some some weight into what I say when I say something is good. And uh, I really thought this was a very solid, you know, obviously not spectacular. It's pretty rare they do something spectacular, but it was a very solid episode. Last week's I thought was extremely safe. I thought it was, you know, hey, people are tuning in for Trinity. Let's get all the, you know, who, who the wrestlers who are viewed. I'm not saying that my words were viewed as the WWE rejects. Let's get them all on the episode doing what they used to do in WWE. So I wasn't really pleased with last week's, but this one, uh, you know, there, there was a couple missteps in my opinion, but for the most part, I just enjoyed the episode. A lot of we on the night, this episode, a lot. Um, and that always pisses me off. You guys know that. But besides that, a lot of really good things happened. So uh, we're going to get into it. Did not watch BTI because I didn't care uh, for, for, uh, Chris Bay versus Zicky Dice. But I may check it out later in the week because I want to continue to monitor Jay Tung, excuse me, Tung, <laughs> Jay Chung doing the ring announcing. You guys know how I feel about uh, the job that Penzer's doing currently. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping that she gets um, called up to the big leagues sooner than later uh, after doing her thing on BTI. So let us get into this episode, which again, was a good one. Uh, very, very little did I hate on this. And I wouldn't even say hate, but there was just some things that, you know, old habits arose a little bit. And, uh, but I saw things this episode that, that just felt a little bit different in a good way. So we kick off with Masha Slamovich versus Killer Kelly. Now, last week, when you have Okay, so let me throw this with Trinity real quick. Because I got into this Twitter conversation with, I'm not going to call it an argument, this Twitter conversation online. And I said that I felt Trinity should have kicked off the show, not closed it. 
So, of course, you know, the loyalists, they step forward. Well, when Kenny Omega closed the show, there was all this extra viewership. Um, you know, you should be building up to her showing up at the very end. You know, that that general thing. These things aren't incorrect. They're not wrong at all. But Trinity is not Kenny Omega. She has not been wrestling for quite some time. And the wrestling audience is very split on her right now. You know, Kenny Omega, when he came over, was very hot. He was the world champion of a show doing over uh, a million views a week. And I know it wasn't all live viewership, but I'm, if you factor in DVR and all that, you're talking well over a million. Okay. They do a hot angle on the TV show leading up to it. Uh, it, it wasn't just, hey, Kenny Omega is going to show up, tune in. You know, like there was a, a storyline involved that people wanted answers to. So they're not the same. Kenny Omega is not Trinity. Trinity is not Trinity is not Kenny Omega. And I don't believe the viewership or the episode even cracked the top 150. They didn't. They don't think they even released the viewership. And if I were watching that episode as, you know, someone who was just there for Trinity, there was nothing on that show to make me come back next week. There was nothing to make me sh sit around and watch the whole episode. You kick it off with Jabba Moore and Boopy. So, so if you're going to say, okay, Trinity's going to go last because we want people to watch the whole show. So you're going to put like two of the losingest guys you got and then Brian Myers, who the WWE audience sees as a job or even though he does good impact work you're gonna open the show with that and expect and then kick it right after that go into santino and dango and, and you're expecting people to stick around so if that's your strategy i don't think that's the way to go about it i would have rather as a fan as a viewer uh them just kicked it off with trinity like and, and i'm not comparing these two but like tony khan did with cm punk a, a long time ago he kicked off the show and people stuck around for it it was their highest uh rampage viewership ever they've never even come close to reaching those numbers so um i would have i would have done that first you know but it's whatever they they kick off the show with with trinity talking and i'm gonna make an impact because everybody says that um you know it was a long intro and then i said okay let's get the episode started and then it's we own the night and then we're three and a half minutes into this before any kind of wrestling starts. But it was Masha versus Killer Kelly. Really good match. Really, really good. Now, these two, I've I've made the comparison before. NXT a long time ago when it was good had Baron Corbin and uh, Bull Dempsey. And both of them were steamrolling people. There was no title match. They weren't in the title picture or nothing like that. They were just doing their own thing steamrolling big people until the fans demanded that the two of them wrestled. And that's really what I would have liked to see with Masha and Killer Kelly. But, you know, Masha's had several title matches that she's lost. Killer Kelly's been, you know, here some weeks, not here the next. But that's really what I've liked, uh, you know, the two of them to be so strong that organically the fans are like, okay, we want them to fight. And, uh, you know, that obviously didn't happen, but I don't think it really took away from the anticipation of watching these two to go at it. And Killer Kelly right now, she wrestles so sparringly that people are excited when she gets her matches, when she's on TV. Um, Killer Cakes. So the match was was really good. I always appreciate a knockouts match that is good, that doesn't involve the title and doesn't involve you know, Deanna or Jordan, you know. And as I've said the last few weeks, they are leaning on the knockouts. Steve Macklin's the champion. They're making these shows about the knockouts. I'm not saying that's that's a bad thing necessarily because the knockouts are still the standard of women's wrestling. Um, and, and I think they should go all in on, uh, you know, making things about the knockouts sometimes. But I would just like to see more. This is Steve Macklin's show. We'll, we'll get into that here in a little bit. The strategy they're using with Steve Macklin is he's doing the top of the nine o'clock hour because the show comes on eight Eastern, right? I, I don't know. I don't watch it as it airs. That's when I think it comes on. 
um, they do it. They do in this top of the second hour with Macklin. That is their their strategy with him, and then close open and close the knockouts. So anyway, the match was excellent, and I really liked the finish because Masha needed this win. She Lord Lord knows she needed this win. I said last week or the week before, I don't know what it is. I think it was two weeks ago. I said stick a fork in her, and now she just loses. And, and it's going to take a lot a long time to build her up again. But I thought this match went a long way towards doing that. And then the finish with Killer Kelly locking the killer clutch after the match is over and choking her out. I mean, I ha- I can't think of an impact match since maybe, I don't know, honestly, it's a weird comparison, but maybe like Tessa Blanchard when she lost the first match with Sammy. I can't think of a a match that Impact has done where someone has looked so good in a, in a loss. And this was not a high-stakes match. This was not a title match. But that is not something that I always feel like they're really strong with. And that's why they do some of the finishes the way they do and the screw job finishes and stuff. They're afraid to have people lose sometimes. And when this match was on paper, I was like, I don't want either of these girls to lose. But Killer Kelly wins, but but I mean, Killer Kelly loses, but then immediately goes into that choke where she's like, I lost, but I don't care. And you have something to sink your teeth into with a rematch now. And we can get it, you know, you that those are the kind of seeds you plant if you want to ultimately get to like a last knockout standing or or something along those lines. So they're starting, um, they're starting off really good here. And we've already forgotten that they wrestled in Team Dreamer versus Team Bully. We we have completely forgotten that even was a thing. Which was the first time they kind of got their hands on each other. I would have preferred if this was the first time, but you know, small potatoes. It was just a, a good opener. Um, I wish this episode happened last week with Trinity. I mean, there was there was very minimal goofiness with this with this episode in general there was a little bit but they just did a very good job with this one and again we can sink our teeth into this now and say what's next for these two we have interest in whatever is next it's not speedball and gresham with 50 50 booking and you know bullshit finishes dqs like this is we we can sink our teeth in this and and we can sit there and say okay what's next for these two we want to see what's next you know, and again, you can really build up to a stipulation um, now. So really good stuff. And then we got Kenny King giving a, a pep talk to talk to Sheldon Jean. And I like this because they seem like they're going to be a very good pairing if that's where they're ultimately going with it. It seems that's what they're they're doing. And then we get the uh, Gia Miller interview with Trinity and Jay Vidal interrupts. And I said last week that the open open contract i'm i'm fairly confident it'll be giselle shaw i think people are thinking it's a debut or something like that i i don't think that's where they're going with it especially because surprises are not their strong point so i do think it's going to be giselle shaw and as soon as jay appeared on the screen uh, this was a bad segment <laughs> i'm not gonna lie but as soon as she uh he appeared on screen I said, okay, I think they're going toward to something with Giselle Shaw, which I think would be very, very, very good. Then we get Nick Aldis versus Sheldon Jean. We've never met Sheldon, or we, we've met him. We've never seen him win. Um, you wouldn't guess that by Penzer uh, introducing them both the same, the same gusto as Sheldon Jean, who's never won, versus Nick Aldis, who's returning and a big signing. <laughs> So um, what what was weird is that they Nick Aldis came out first, you know that was that was just kind of odd to me. Then Kenny King's on com- commentary, and this was this match was good for what it was. They have something with Sheldon Jean, I think. I think we're gonna see them tweak things over the weeks, and I think he's. I I just have this weird feeling he's gonna be a very um, engaging part of this show. Like we're we're gonna have interest in seeing him on screen. And interest in seeing Sheldon Jean and Kenny King together. I, I, just, I just got a feeling that this is going to be a good part of the show. And, um, you know, Nick Aldis gets the win. Obviously, we knew they were going this direction. And I said last week that Kenny King is a perfect first opponent for Nick Aldis. And I, I just have a lot of respect for Nick Aldis because there's no doubt in my mind um, that Scott DeCuck didn't go up to him and 
say, hey, you want to wrestle at Under Siege for the world title? Like, there's no doubt in my mind because we see this time and time again. And, uh, you know, I feel like he declined. And we get that in his promos where he knows he knows what makes a world champion. Whether he's the challenger or the title holder, he knows the little things to uh, to make it look and feel prestigious. And he knows that he just waltz in, waltzes in and gets a title shot like everyone else does. That, you know, it's just the same TNA shit. So I've got a lot of respect. But there's no doubt in my mind that they didn't pitch him a world title shot immediately uh, when he came came aboard. No, no fucking doubt in my mind. But it looks like we'll actually get this at Slammiversary, which is what we want. Um, but Nick Aldis obviously wins. You know, but but Sheldon Jean had a had a nice little showing here. He attacked Nick Aldis immediately when the bell rang, and I and he missed. I would have liked to see him hit that move because it would have felt it would have um it would have lined up with the backstage thing with Kenny with Kenny Omega, Kenny King, where he's getting fired up and supporting him and saying, you know, go out and get it. Uh if if Sheldon Jean would have just I, I, I don't know what it wasn't like a scissors kick, but he went for some kind of kick. Um, if he would have just hit that, hit that off the bat, I think that would have been very impactful. But um, I do think they got something with this guy. And we got uh, Joe Hendry and Dango backstage continuing their investigation on who attacked Santino. I saw someone on uh, Facebook the other day say, am I the only one that's just dying to know what ha- happened to Santino? I'm just like, yes. Now, I gave a lot of props to Dango's comedy and humor in this last week. I thought it was very funny last week. I'm glad that the segment was as long as it was, so you can see the board and all the pictures and the names and the little stickies he put on there. He put a lot of thought into it. <laughs> it was it was pretty good. It was very funny. And, um, and then we get, you know, Swinger and Zicky Dice show up. And Swinger's funny, Zicky Dice. Eh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know. But they get Santino on the phone. He said, who's this? He said, it's, <laughs> he said, it's Dango for, for, for wrestling. I don't know if you guys caught that, but um, very, very funny, just under his breath humor. But then they, you know, they set up uh, Dango versus Zicky Dice, which ugh, I don't know about that one. On such a good episode, this felt really, really out of place. And then uh, the sit down interview with Frankie Kazarian. <laughs> They call it the groundbreaking interview. They did it on the website and the Twitter. I think it's kind of a reach. It's kind of, you know, groundbreaking, but but I'd like to see them do more of this. I don't really expect that they will do a lot, whole lot more of it because history says that when they come when they do things like this, it's very short term. They can say, oh, this is a brand new this and this, brand new segment. You know, it's always short term. Everything that they they try to not everything. That's a strong word, but a lot of things things they try to introduce onto the show are very short lived. I mean, remember Impact Faithful, that lasted two episodes. So, you know, it's just, it's just not really. We'll, we'll see, but I like I love to see more of this. I just don't see outside of the Motor City Machine Guns who who they can sit down with and and you know, Frankie has the TNA video package, and they're building towards something with him. You know, like he can, he'll probably win the world title at some point. At least I think he will. But I, I can't think of many people on the roster that could really do this and have the videos and 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 the real backstory that we care about. So that's why I just said I don't, I don't think this is going to last um, too entirely long. And then we got Decay versus the Good Hands. On paper, I'm like, what is this? And uh, the Good Hands, but but no, but it was good. I will say in the last couple months, and I pointed out that the shows have been really jobber heavy. And if that offends you, the jo- jobbers, I'm sorry, the impact jobbers, but the good hands, the Alicia's, the uh, the Sheldon Jeans, the Johnny Swingers, um, on and on, Boopy, Yuya, all, all the people who lose, they've just been dominating the television shows. But with that being said, the matches are getting a little bit of time. They're not, um, you know, usually Champagne Sin goes out there and he loses in, in two minutes, but they're letting these guys work a little. They're giving him an opportunity. And I'm always saying, throw shit at the wall, see if it sticks. So, you know, they gave good hands a little bit more time here that they, than they typically do. And they took on decay. 
this tag team is so shallow, this tag team division, that the whole time I was thinking it was just the Motor City Machine Guns and the Bullet Club. Like, I completely forget about some of these other teams that they actually do have sometimes. I, I, I think it's a branding issue because it just doesn't, it just, it always feels like the tag team division and impact is a one or two team division. It has felt like that for years. It's not like, okay, who's next to step up. It just like the X division. It doesn't matter who's a champion. Like there's so many people they can, they can put in and challenge and you don't feel like it's a one person division, but with the tag team, it's always like, it just always feels like a one or two team division. It, it has for a long time. Can't argue with me on that one. You know I'm right. But anyway, the good hands get the win. They get the win. They beat Decay. And I'm always talking about what are these motherfuckers finishers? Like we we saw a fucking finisher. We saw a tag team finisher from the good hands. I cannot believe it. So they win, and it's with the help of Brian Myers. And Brian Myers and them is a tremendous. What's the word? Pairing. But pairing is with two, right? They fit perfect. When Brian Myers had the learning tree, I thought that was a very original and good part of the show. And it was very short lived. And then they got rid of everybody and it was pointless. They had the the Sam whatever dude who <laughs> Scott DeCuck was like, hey, you know, watch out for Sam. I don't even remember what his, his name was. He's an up and comer in Impact and they release him a month later. So uh, this has this has learning tree vibes to it. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I was glad to see the the, the good hands actually get a win. I'm I'm just mind blown by this. You just expect when you see them that they're gonna lose. You know, uh, John Scholar he cut a promo and he's real hit or miss. He comes out and it's it's a little heel one on one. The first thing he said about decay about, you know, then he said Chicago was the one decaying or whatever it was. He said the cesspool of a city. I'm not referring to the tag team. I'm referring to the cesspool that the, the cesspool that is the city, something along those lines. I thought that was good. And then he went to the Chicago well one too many times and, you know, tried to, oh, the Chicago Cubs is a better chance. Like, and the crowd was dead for that because he just. They love their cubbies there, but you know you you can't go to the well too many times, Mister Skyler. So good to see Good Hands get a win. Quick backstage segment with Steve Macklin and Champagne Singh and Shira, where he's based. Macklin is basically telling them that their business uh, venture is over, that the partnership is over. And then Champagne says, just, "You know," after he walks away, he said, "Well, this is the world." champion we can't let this slip through our fingers like they know that being involved with him uh means more uh you know even from a kayfabe standpoint more main events you're featured more you're on screen more (coughs) you know so um so this was cool what was weird though is that after macklin walks away it walks away he's kind of like Okay, we I, I I got something, and then all they do is jump Heath. Like what? What was that shit? Then security is, get a doctor over here. Unfortunately, they have no real doctors on site, so you're probably probably shit out of luck, Heath. Um, there's steth- stethoscopes on on site though. Then we get world champion Macklin versus Rhino. And as I said at the top of the show, they're doing the strategy with Macklin. They're not closing the show with him. Not opening the show with him. They are doing the top of the second hour. That's his segment. That's his match. And I don't know enough about television to say if that's a good thing. The concept is that's when people are finishing up other shows and they're switching channels, seeing what's on. So technically, it's an important part, uh, you know, part of the show. But I, I mentioned before that this needs to be this. This needs to feel like the Steve Macklin show. That's when uh, world title reigns for heels are very impactful, and it does not feel like that. Uh, we get Rhino challenging for the world title, and when he announces this is a world title match, I'm like, why? 
what the hell has he done to deserve a world title shot when you've got five of your top stars and Yuya wrestling in a six way for their opportunity at the world title? Five of those guys in that six way match hold a higher status than Rhino in the company. And they are wrestling a number one contenders match, and Rhino just gets a world title shot. I don't know why they don't just say, hey, this is a non-title match. So what they do in AW, they call them eliminator matches. When the champion randomly wrestles some dude or some chick, they say this is an eliminator match. No one's ever won in an eliminator match as far as the challenger goes. But essentially, that's a non-title match. And if they win the non-title match, then they get a title shot. <clears throat> Not that I want to see Rhino win, but at least if you just church it up in some way where like, hey, this is not for the world title. You know, it, it just, I just feel like it's more effective that way rather than saying, hey, we'll see Macklin's wrestling. So he has to defend the title. I mean, that's just what he does. He's the champion. Every, every time the champion wrestles, they have to defend it. You know, and... You know, they kind of did that with Josh. They felt like he had to defend the title every other week, and then they ran out of people for him to wrestle. You know, thank God that they had the storyline with Macklin, but there's that line of competitors and challengers is not there for him. Uh, from the babyface side, they're not there. So don't make him defend the title so much. Just non-title matches. Easy. But Macklin works the leg, and he wins with the gore. Which, again, would be so much more impactful if everyone didn't do the spear in the company. I mean, last week, the first match ended with a spear. The second match had a gore after the bell. I mean, it's the same fucking moves in all these matches. If, if, if you know, but beating someone with their own finisher, always a good thing. I think that that's always good. Because usually when wrestlers try to do that, the opponent kicks out and eh. So good finish. <clears throat> Jesus. I'm sorry with the coughing, folks. Oh, man. I hate when podcasters do that, when they're like sick on the air. And I try my damn hardest to be to be okay for this episode, but uh, it's going to happen. So, yes, uh, Steve Mackin gets the win as we expect that he will. Now, here's one of the parts about the episode that I thought was a low point. Right. So after the match, and this is fine. They're starting to do post-match angles, which is good. Instead of, let's play the video game sound immediately after the match and jump to a backstage with Gia. They're starting to let things breathe a little bit after the bell. So he takes a steel chair, com continues to work Rhino's knee. And then they, you know, they come back from the commercial and say, hey, here's footage from the commercial break. And they're putting Rhino in an ambulance. And if for you know, it was kind of they this could have been so much better. But, you know, Scott the headset goes back there and it's like, "All right, take care of this one. We'll see you later, buddy." He is not even selling that Rhino's in like real real fucking pain. Like like we want to feel like he may never wrestle again. He's so messed up. But they put him out there and um you know, this is the Scott segment of the show that we're we're always going to get. You say, your your match against PZO, no disqualification, lazy booking, right? What? Of course, we're going to get our street fight. We're going to get our no rules, our no holds barred, our no DQ. We know that we're going to get that, and it means fucking nothing. And usually, it's a way of taking the easy rate way out when the two wrestlers styles clash. Um, they said, let's throw no DQ in. That's the only way we can beat PCO, right? Uh, bury him uh, under a pile of chairs or something like that. So anyway, um, after he lets him know, then Steve Macklin, I don't know what it was he said, but he opened that back door because he was going to continue to beat on Rhino. And PCO jumps out. And it came off really goofy, in my opinion. I think they were trying to go for the, the, the shock value. 
but I, I thought it was silly. I mean, we're doing magic again. People are transporting. Here's my thing with this segment, folks. So Steve Macklin works the damn knee. He destroys the knee after the match. He's getting heat. If you're going to go for heat, go for heat. Open that fucking back door of the ambulance, drag his house and his ass out and whoop his ass some more make it feel like he may never show up on tv again we've been saying this i have been the guys of brace for impact people on twitter macklin needs definitive wins he needs to be running through opponents not wrestling for eight minutes versus dango if you're going to go for the heat go for the heat but instead, they wanted PCO to show up on the episode, get one up on the world champ, because they think that's the that's the way we are, are going to get thrown off the scent that Macklin's going to win, is if PCO just keeps getting the upper hand on him. So open the ambulance door, beat the shit out of him. Leave him bloody. Because now we're building some, we have some sympathy for Rhino, and Rhino can come back at one point and attack Steve Macklin out of nowhere, and people would care. Now, he sends him off in an ambulance. PCO, we make the, seg- the segment becomes about PCO all of a sudden. We forget that Rhino's in the ambulance, and, and it's going to be like last time when he got hurt, and then he showed back up. I'm like, I didn't, I forgot he was on the roster. I, did, I couldn't even remember why he got hurt last time. I think it was like violent by design or something. I, I, I didn't even remember why. I didn't, I didn't care. But you could have given us something lasting that we that we remember, and then Macklin comes off looking like a million bucks, and that builds him towards his his match with PCO, not PCO jumping out of the freaking ambulance and attacking him, and it just back to square one, you know, with with Macklin in my opinion and this feud, it just just back to square one. And Dirty Dingo, <clears throat> excuse me, God. Took on Johnny Swinger. I think I said it earlier in the show. It was him versus Zicky Dice. I, I might have said that by accident. But it's Dango versus Swinger, and they get a little bit of time. You know, they didn't. It wasn't a, a <coughs> excuse me ten minute match, but they got a little bit of time. And uh, Dango hits the Falcon Arrow, and gets the win. Um, I'm glad this was over when it was. I thought it was kind of one of the lower points of the show. And then we get the design on the screen. And there's red lights, just like when Killer Kelly comes out. Um, everyone's red. And at first I was like, I don't care. I don't care. But then I cared. Because the the members of the Army of Violence come out in their yellow hoodies. And two of them are Sammy Callahan and Rich Swan, And they attack them. I thought this was really good. I think we're definitely getting Rich Swan as a mystery partner. But you have to, have to, have to make that other partner Jake Christ. If it is Tommy fucking Dreamer, if it is Bully Ray, the match might get booed out of the building. The people don't want that. They are asking for Jake Christ to show up here. They're asking for Madman Fulton. They want one of those two people. Anybody else is a huge letdown and makes this feud even worse than it has been, or this story, I should say. But I did like this. I liked the surprise attack from Rich Swan and Sammy Callahan. I thought that was very well done. And here comes another cough. <coughs> Backstage, we got Moose. He wants answers from Brian Myers why he was out there helping the good hands. He says he wants to mold them into tag team champions. And Moose actually said, you know, we're the tag team, which Moose has never done that. Moose Moose has his his business part, you know, business partners or or whatever it is. That's what Moose typically has. So he's actually said, hey, we're a tag team. So if you're a tag team, be a tag team. And I'd love to see them win the titles. I would love. Everyone wants Moose to have gold. But it seems like the wrestlers that they have around long term, they don't want them to be champions. It's it's the 
you know, it's the people who are there for six months that get the title shots and get the title reigns. So, and then, you know, he had said, well, it doesn't seem very tag team of you that you're in this six way. And then Moose says, you know, I can be world champion and a tag team champion. So very nice little exchange backstage. But I, again, I really do like the good hands with, with Brian Myers together. They never really fit with Bully Ray because all they ever did was show up for attacks, but they were never like next really. They were very rarely next to Bully Ray in the ring where they even where Bully Ray even acknowledged them on camera. It's like they were kind of around him, but Bully was never. Brian Myers spoke to the good hands more this episode than Bully Ray spoke to them the entire time they were they were together. <clears throat> and then we get um the under siege card and the impact card and it's wheel in the night for five straight minutes as usual. And I'm going to say it every fucking time. You've got a song for under siege. Play the song. Play that for the under siege card. And um, you know, what's weird is that impact fans on social media do more to, to promote the ultimate insider and impact plus than the company does. Where's the lie? Right, Bobby Fish, where's the lie? The Impact fans do way more. I see it all the time. Someone, you know, how do I watch Impact? And it's the fans responding saying, you can subscribe to Ultimate Insiders on YouTube for $4.99 or, or $1.99 and get this. Like, I, there's never on these episodes, okay, Under Siege is coming. How do we fucking watch it? I know it's on Fight. Awesome. You want people to get to order on Fight too. I get it. But you've got these other platforms that you want to make money with, and you're not telling people how to how to sign up or what the value is. I know I say that a lot because it bothers me a lot. We're getting Trey Miguel versus uh, Laredo Kid. We're getting Moose, Eddie, and Kazarian against Shelly, Gresham, and Jabamora. And this is the... We have to have everyone wrestle each other because they're going to wrestle each other in a six way. So now we got to see if they can coexist in in six man tag. Uh, Lazy. Main event. Knockouts World Tag Team Champions. The Coven versus Deanna Perrazzo and Jordan Grace. So these when the episodes are good, there's there is very little Santino, very little. goofiness backstage with the coven or the death dolls very little scott demore um there's 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 a formula for where the episode is good and where the episode is bad so the coven is starting to figure this out i really thought that they were the death of the knockouts tag team titles at first i thought they were the death of the knockouts tag team division like no shit but they are starting to figure it out and to make this gimmick work and I'm going to put over Taylor Wilde's podcast. She re- she interviewed this past week, uh, Soraya. And these are the good Taylor Wilde interviews. Okay? Because I said last week or the week before, if you want 45 minutes of your time wasted, listen to Taylor Wilde's podcast. Because once she became part of the Ultimate Insiders, the interviews have been horrible. They are talking about tarot cards and shit nobody cares about. And it's like entire episodes on this shit. Where we want some kind of backstory. We don't want the AW unrestricted style of uh, Wikipedia interviews. But we want something. Give us fucking something about the wrestler. So she did a really good job with uh, Soraya's interview this past week. So I think you should check that out. But the Coven is starting to figure it out to where it's not silly and goofy. And I think having Kylan King speak a little bit more. Has has gone a long way towards that. So they're taking on Deanna Perrazzo and Jordan Grace. When they first announced this, I really thought Deanna and Jordan were going to win. And this was a pretty solid tag team match. I'm very high on Kylan King. I am very high on her. I think she's an, a future knockouts champion. But I'm starting to come around on the coven a little bit. And... This matches what we knew it would be. It was very good. What I really liked was that the Coven got a clean victory. You know, I know they knocked Deanna off the apron, but there was no 
after that it was they, they were Jordan just got pinned because she got double teamed. There was just you know they didn't uh, hit her with a chair or a, a baking sheet. She just got double teamed and she lost. And I thought the Coven came out looking strong. So for this episode, I felt in general the winners felt like they had some momentum after the match. It didn't feel like matches for the sake of matches, which they like to do sometimes. I felt that every winner left with momentum. And then Killer Kelly, who lost, still left with momentum. And that's what I, I'm always saying that. Where's the momentum? Who's hot? And I feel like everyone was at the beginning stages of their snowball when they won. Like, okay, now get a couple more wins. And now, now we're building something. So I was overjoyed that the coven got this win now i shut the episode off after this by the way um i was i was um got at the dobby the brain i was corrected that they've been calling jordan the juggernaut for a while but it has to be i mean minimal because last week when they announced there's a juggernaut i said what the fuck are they talking about and then they just like now they're like constantly like the juggernaut the juggernaut so if it was said before, it had to have been, you know, once a match, maybe twice, because I never heard it, and now I hear it nonstop. So, uh, you know, last week I had said that they just made it up out of nowhere, but no, that's not the case. That is a thing. That is a thing. So I got to acknowledge that. But as I said, I shut it off at the end, and... I didn't know that they did the W, uh, excuse me, the AEW finish <coughs> with the attack after the match, continuing to attack. I would have loved if they went off the air with the Coven looking strong. And Trinity runs down and hits the rear view, one of the worst moves in wrestling. And now it is setting up Kylan King versus. Trinity, we know Colin King is going to lose. I just didn't think they wanted to get Trinity in the ring. They wanted to get her on screen. I get it. It was really weird that she didn't wrestle this episode. Like, usually they have someone debut and they blow the load and, and they wrestle immediately, you know? Like, they didn't do that with Nick Aldis or Trinity. They built it up a little, which I'm always asking for that. Build, build a little bit of anticipation. So, a very good job with that. I was very shocked that she didn't wrestle, but. Um, you know, this was real AEW right here. The post match beat down, you know, and um, Trinity coming for the save and taking two people out by herself. And then the Coven, who was strong, now loses next week. So they, they so I have to retract what I said a little bit <clears throat> where I thought everyone came out looking really strong because here they went off the episode. And I always say this. The person they go off the episode with is the one that they feel is the star. They do not, for whatever reason, take any chances and say, hey, we're going off the air with the coven with their hands raised. They they do not do that. They won't do that. It's going to be who's our WWE people, who's our short-term people, you know, who's our couple of our world champions. Like, they'll go off the screen. Um but some people just absolutely won't. And just that little, you know, that little detail, Coven, <coughs> Coven going off the screen, um, looking strong, that would have made them look good and made us forget some of the losing they've been doing. And then if they wanted to do a post-match angle, they could have leveraged social media, Twitter, Instagram, the Facebook page that they've completely given up on. They played the Orlando screw job today with Hulk Hogan and Kurt Angle and AJ Styles. That's what they had on Facebook today. They have completely given up on this platform, but leverage those platforms, leverage YouTube and say, this happened after Impact went off the air and let that circulate online. And with that being said, Trinity will go one-on-one -on -one next week with Kylan King instead of the cookie cutter finish where you don't want the wrestlers who you don't consider stars to go off the air with their with their belts up. So didn't really care for all that. But um overall, enjoyable episode. 
Everyone looked good. No one looked like a, a goof except maybe Steve Macklin when PCO jumped out of the ambulance. And there's com- some people who are always goofs on the show. Um, and they don't necessarily wrestle. So I thought they did a good job. <clears throat> when they announced this show, I said on Twitter, like, this is the best looking card they put together in a while. Um, we'll see how they follow it up. 2023 has not been a strong year for television for Impact. But more episodes like this, and, and I think that's a good thing, less like last week's. Less with the, you know, the bad comedy. Because the who, who attacked Santino? So I saw someone the other day say, so well, well, Killer Cross did, you know, attack people backstage. I said, this is more who shot Bravo than it is Killer Cross. There, there's not a, a comparison here. The Killer Cross stuff was serious. It wasn't, it was um like you knew you knew a big dog was showing up. This wasn't, you know, a, a comedy angle like what we're getting now. And I don't hate I don't hate the Santino stuff. I mean, I, you know, the Dango, I don't know, I don't hate it, but you just gotta be careful in thinking that the majority of impact fans care about it because I don't think that they do. You know, they they it, it's kind of like when Falaba had the money, where that's that was just so fucking bad. And they thought that the Impact fan base liked it, you know? And and they didn't. But they doubled down, they tripled down, and just kept going with it to where they start bringing in the knockouts, getting involved, and there was matches over the over the the wad of ones. You know, it was a wad of ones wrapped with a hundred dollar bill. So that's all I got, folks. Good episode. Let's hope that they continue this uh, ball rolling. Trinity wrestles on the show next week, so you know, hopefully, it's uh, people. More people going to tune in because they didn't tune in last time for her. But uh, hopefully, they do with this. I just don't think going off the show with her attacking your tag team champions is the way to do it. I just thought get on social media. This happened after the match, and and you know. The news is going to travel a lot faster that way that she's wrestling. What the fuck do I know? I'm your boy BQ. I'm out. Peace.